What drives someone to commit a violent crime? Is the person born bad or raised to be this way? Are criminals born or made? This is the University of the Netherlands. I'm going to tell you the story of Joseph. He was only 10 years old when he shot and killed his father. How could a child ever do something so violent? In this case, the answer seems quite simple. He was raised around hate and violence. His father was a rising star among white supremacists in the United States. According to court records, the father used methamphetamines and alcohol throughout Joseph's life. He kept loaded weapons in easy reach of the children, strewn around the house. He was abusive towards Joseph and his stepmother. But that's not the whole story. You see, Joseph's life was problematic before he was born. His exposure to drugs and alcohol began in the womb when his mother, while pregnant, consumed heroin, meth, LSD, marijuana, and alcohol. He had pervasive ADHD and low average intelligence. At school, he had a hard time sitting still and repeatedly threw violent temper tantrums and was violent towards his classmates and teachers. He changed school six times before his father and stepmother decided to homeschool him. So was Joseph born violent and prone to become a criminal or made one as a result of his environment? In this lecture, we'll explore what contributes to making a criminal. Now, to be honest, have you ever stolen anything or done something you shouldn't have? You probably have. Most of us have. When I was much younger, I was involved in petty vandalism and theft. Surprisingly, research shows that criminal behavior among adolescents is actually normal and very common. At around the age of 12 or 13, you start becoming involved in antisocial behavior, pulling pranks, and maybe even stealing something small from a supermarket or candy store. This behavior is peer-influenced and usually stops at early adulthood. The outliers are actually those that abstain completely from breaking the rules. There's another group of offenders, outliers, who begin to show problematic behavior at an early age, around the age of three. These individuals, if left untreated, may grow up to commit criminal offenses throughout their lives. They commit frequent, diverse, and often serious crimes like armed robbery, sexual assault, and homicide. As you can tell, crime describes many behaviors. Today, we're focusing on why people resort to violent crime. If we measure these two diverse groups, the ones who never commit a crime, the abstainers, and the frequent serious offenders on personality traits, we see that they're polar opposites. This gives us insight into common traits of criminals. Criminals prefer to rebel instead of conforming to the rules. They have low self-control and they behave impulsively rather than cautiously. They're more likely to take advantage of others. It doesn't take much for them to feel betrayed and used by their friends, and they become easily upset and irritable. Obviously, if you exhibit any of these traits, it doesn't automatically make you a hardcore criminal. It's just one piece of the puzzle. So let's look at a few other pieces, starting with how people are socialized to become criminals. In other words, let's start with the nurture part of the age-old nature versus nurture question. To investigate further how people's pasts can lead to criminal behavior, we look at Martin. Martin is a fictional character I created based upon what we know from research about violent criminals. This specific offender might not be real, but prisons all over the world are filled with people just like him. Martin is a 17-year-old male who robbed and stabbed his victim when the victim refused to hand over cash and car keys. What would you say is the appropriate punishment or intervention in this case? You could argue that Martin acted on his own free will. He might have simply weighed the criminal gains against the cost and risk of getting caught. We should punish him. But for punishment to be effective, it should be certain, swift, and severe, but proportional to the crime. It should prevent not only our perpetrator from committing another crime, but should also send a message to others in the community that crime does not pay and will result in punishment. Many sentences are given based on this idea. 
you might agree with this type of type line of thinking, but you could change your mind when you learn about Martin's life. After Martin was born, his mother, living in poverty, suffered from depression. Due to her mental illness, she rejected him and was incapable of taking care of him. Throughout the first three years of his life, he was under the care of Child Protective Services and placed in an institution, and then moved to various foster families. This failure to bond with a caring parent has been linked to later involvement in criminal behavior. Martin was returned to his mother at age four and suffered physical and sexual abuse by his mother and a number of her boyfriends. Those who have been physically abused in the first five years of life, like our perpetrator, are at greater risk of developing violent and criminal behavior. Children that grow up in households where violence is frequent and normal learn that aggression is a valid way to deal with problems and frustration. They may grow up with poor role models and copy this behavior as they get older. Our perpetrator performed poorly in school and had to repeat a year. He left school without a diploma in part because he reported being rejected by most of his peers throughout his teens. He was a bit of a loner, you might say, until he met a group of older boys at the corner bar and began hanging out with them. It was then and through them that he became involved with drugs. Martin says that his drug addiction was ultimately the reason for committing the robbery. This developmental pathway into violence can be explained by what professor of psychology and neuroscience Kenneth Dodge calls the dynamic cascade model. This model describes the pathway to violence like slowly accelerating towards a waterfall until you finally slide over the edge. So Martin was born into a bad environment with neglectful parents. This predicts social and cognitive problems we see in later life, like trouble learning and eventual academic failure. His mother wasn't around to supervise him, and all this pushed him towards the wrong kind of people, which ultimately led to violence and criminal behavior. Martin's actions were clearly wrong, and he is still responsible for them. But now we understand better how he came to be the way he is. This slide into delinquency that Dodge describes can start even earlier than childhood. We already know that drug abuse, high stress, and poor health during pregnancy has a negative impact on the intelligence and temperament of the baby, as we've seen was the case with Joseph. The same was true for Martin. But we can look even further back than the prenatal period. Studies have pointed to the influence of a particular genotype on aggressive behavior. It's been dubbed the warrior gene. In and of itself, the gene will not predispose one to violent behavior. But when coupled with a negative environment in which children are exposed to maltreatment, a pattern emerges. Severely maltreated boys with the genotype were more likely to exhibit so-called antisocial behavior than those with the gene who suffered little or no abuse. Does this influence your understanding of how Martin came to rob and stab his victim? Knowing all this, how harshly would you sentence him? It's not very helpful really, to look at nature or nurture as two segments or as two separate causes of crime. That's why we look at crime through a biosocial lens. Biosocial criminologists borrow from a variety of disciplines, including biology, genetics, neuroscience, sociology, and psychology. They tell us that the interaction between biological predisposition to aggression and a negative environment is the strongest predictor of violence. Martin was exposed to multiple risk factors, both biological and social, environmental. So how do these factors play a role in the type of criminal we've all heard of and are fascinated by? Psychopathic killers. Psychopaths are involved in all forms of crime, especially crimes of violence. You're probably thinking of serial killers like Ted Bundy. He was considered handsome, charismatic, smart, and hardworking, but he used those traits to manipulate, kidnap, and murder dozens of young women. Bundy manifested what forensic psychologist Robert D. Hare called the psychopathic traits. Psychopaths tend to be charming and verbally fluent, yet cold and calculated, the type you often see in Hollywood movies or Netflix films. These individuals barely feel any empathy, but they understand how emotions work and how they can use this knowledge to manipulate others. How does someone become a psychopath, and what did their childhoods look like? 
The same risk factors that we saw earlier are at play, but these individuals usually also have a neurophysiological basis for psychopathy. They barely respond physically to fear, which may disrupt the formation of guilt, conscience, or fear of punishment. This, coupled with negative social factors, can produce psychopathy. Criminal psychopaths in this form of, of extremely violent offenders, the Bundy type, make up a tiny fraction of the population, and serial killers are extremely rare. So it's highly unlikely that you will ever encounter a Ted Bundy. Given everything that can go wrong in a person's life, you might feel like some individuals are almost doomed to end up as criminals. So should we just give up on these people? Of course not. What we can do is identify risk factors or problematic domains in the child's life so that we can intervene appropriately and in a timely fashion. We can already observe problematic behavior at the age of three. If we can intervene at an early age, we might be able to get these kids back on track. You could look for high-risk, soon-to-be possibly young single mothers that are struggling or abusing substances during pregnancy. It can be as simple as educating these mothers about the effects of cigarettes, alcohol, or drugs, and what these effects have on their baby. It seems like common knowledge, but sometimes parents don't fully understand the impact these contaminants can have on the cognitive development of their unborn child. We would like to believe that every parent wants his or her child to do well in school and get a good start in life. Once the child is born, we then have to give the parents the tools to properly raise the child. Dodge's second risk domain is early harsh parenting. Have you ever seen the show Super Nanny? We can take a similar approach. We can send someone into the home to teach young parents good parenting skills. That person can offer tools to help deal with out-of-control children without resorting to violence. Children coming from socially deprived neighborhoods could be provided with breakfasts. Children can think and function better when eating properly. Due to many reasons, inability to provide meals for their children or lack of understanding about the importance of nutrition, parents might not supply their children with breakfast. They send that child to school. The child can't stay awake and can't function or remember what it's being taught. The child might become frustrated and more irritable. School performance suffers. Peer rejection or bullying may follow. This can quickly become our downward spiral. We don't usually consider free school breakfast or behavioral parent training to be a crime prevention program, but they are. They're programs that will ultimately contribute to the health and well-being of these children and improve the quality of the relationship of the child with the parents. These simple measures may protect children from pathways into crime. Once individuals start on these pathways into frequent and serious offending, measures become more complex, more expensive, and more time-consuming. And once individuals start down a pathway to crime, it becomes more difficult to break the pattern. It is essential that interventions start early. So, is it nature or nurture? Are criminals born or made? It seems clear that you can never really point at one thing, such as genetics, abuse, drugs, poor maternal bonding, problematic parenting, or peer influence and say, that's why this person became a criminal. There are so many risk factors that appear and influence us at different times in our lives. We need to be compassionate and offer help to struggling parents and their children. But these programs need to be well-researched and participants must be matched to the program designed to meet their needs. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. Programs may have to be tailor-made for a specific group or even for a specific individual. What works well for the local population might not work with immigrant families. What works well with males might not be applicable to females. There isn't a fix-all solution to breaking the cycle of violence. Still, as you've seen, providing families with something as simple as free breakfast can make a huge difference. Thank you so much for watching.